Did you ever wanted to know on how camera traps work? How all this is done and how much such a camera trap system costs? All this and much more will be covered in this tutorial on how to camera trap wildlife. My name is Yannick and I will show you my secrets on my camera trapping photography journey. But now to the setup. In general, you can distinguish between two ways of operating a camera trap. One is the wired system in which the motion detector and the flashes are all connected to the camera via a cable. The big advantage of this system is that it is relatively inexpensive and in terms of battery capacity it's much more durable and very more reliable than a wireless system. The other option is the wireless system like one I have here. The big advantage here is that I'm completely free uh, with my creativity and completely independent on how I set up a flash in which direction and I don't have to look on how long the cable is and where I have to put the cable. That's pretty easy. And altogether with this system it's a bit more fragile but I have a lot more space to let my creativity run free. The two systems differ enormously in price, but more about that later. I have a self-made housing here, which I built from a waterproof case. And with this setup, you're completely free with the shape and how you position the camera in there. The only thing is the camera needs to fit in. but. Nevertheless, I've seen cameras where the hole is there. Um, I just put it here because of the sensors and for my arrange arrangement in the camera trap, it is just perfect. If we open the whole thing, we can see how I solved it inside with, it, uh, with this housing. First of all, we have the heart of the camera, which is in this case, uh, Nikon D3200 and the advantage of these small cameras are that they are not expensive but still have a very strong sensor in terms of megapixels because the ISO doesn't make that much uh, of an impact because with the flashes you could also always go about ISO 100 to 400 but more about that later and another very big point is that if damage occurs at, uh, or the camera gets stolen, you don't lose quite so much money as if you have a Nikon Z6 or a Nikon D6 or something uh, inside. So you don't lose that much money. On top of the flash shoe is the transmitter, which transmits the signals to the flashes. The battery life of the transmitters in general is not that long. With normal AAA batteries, I get up to one to at maximum two weeks if there's not too much activities from the animals. But with these large battery packs, which consists of two double D cells, each of them has like 10,000 milliampere hours, I can extend the running time for up to eight weeks. So let's put it back inside. And this is then connected to the transmitter. If we look at the inside of the cover, we see a receiver here that receives a signal from the motion detector and forwards them to the camera, which then ideally should trigger the camera. And also this transmitter is equipped with a double D battery pack um, to guarantee a long lifetime. In this system, I don't have the camera connected to an external power device, but in my second system, the camera runs on so-called NPF batteries, which also have an enormous amount of energy and 
the camera can run for like I got it out for eight weeks and it was never a problem in case of power and if we look at the flash we see that it is also in a housing I designed the housing myself with some development help and I had it 3d printed by a friend of mine and I have to say I'm pretty happy with the result it's waterproof it's has been out for like minus 8 minus 10 degrees out in the snow and it was absolutely no problem at all and if you want the files for your flash housing with your camera trapping project feel free to write me uh, to get the 3d files and let me know then you can buy them for a small cost of 10 euros as an alternative i can also recommend these Tupperware boxes uh, they are waterproof and also not very expensive and that is all the the always nice to go uh, result and or always the nice to go way if we just open the housing we see that we have at once the flash which is attached to a receiver which in turns is powered to a double D battery pack there is a special feature with those flashes you should definitely make sure that it is one of the following flashes I will blend you up in the video the reason why is that these models have an enormously good standby mode which guarantees a long run time of these flashes which is if you don't want to extra power these flashes enormously uh, important so the working models are listed here at first we have the Nikon SB24 the SB26 uh, then the most common one is the SB the 28DX then the ones I have in here is the 80DX from Nikon then are the a bit more expensive ones is the SB600 from Nikon and the SB800 but we'll take a look on how to set up these guys later so let's move on to the sensor I have the PR motion sensor from Camtraptions. Um, Camtraptions is a very common and quite dominant brand in the camera trap sector. I am basically pretty happy with the sensor and the runtime is enormously good. I had like it out for three months without even have to change the batteries at all. And I always use rechargeable batteries in every system I use so and they don't even have that much power than a normal battery but never left me alone with this in case of power and I also never missed a shot with it maybe sometimes it takes a bit too much images because maybe it's a setting part uh, you have to, to set the sensitivity a bit lower but that is the only thing about this system that I have to say yeah, okay maybe a bit too much but the more important thing is you get the shot you want and in this case the camera trap uh, motion sensor here is perfect on the left side you have different modes and you can you can do with these toggle switches I'll show you my settings here but I won't go into the any more detail as there are plenty of other tutorials on these sensors however if you have any questions please feel free to contact me via email or via Instagram on or however you can contact me and I'll try to give you information about all that stuff here as quickly as possible on the right side if we open these wings here you can make different settings and I guess the signs are actually very self-explanatory nevertheless there's not only this one provider 
There's also a provider called Cognizis, for example, which works with a laser barrier. However, I think the system with the laser barrier is very expensive at the one part. So I personally prefer definitely the PIR motion detectors because they are, as I said, much easier to set up. However, I would not want to deprive you of the what is probably the cheapest option to get such a motion sensor. And that would be to build such a sensor yourself. There are various suppliers who sell circuit boards with a PRR motion sensor just as, as this one for cheap money. With a little skill and technical know-how you can easily build an extremely effective sensor for a little money. So now you know everything you need for such a camera trapping system. But always the big question for me is how much does such a system really cost? As I mentioned before, the range can vary greatly, but I'll give you two possible cost calculations for a wired and a wireless system. So you can decide which system is best for you. So first we have the camera. In this case, it's a Nikon D3200 which is in use about 150 euro. We have the lens, which is a 100, uh, 15 to 55 millimeter from Nikon, which is used about 50 euro. We have two flashes, which are about 100 euros. We have the housing, so the, the water seal boxing, which is about 40 euros. We have the transmitter, uh, the transmitters, uh, which are incomplete about 40 euros we have the motion detector in this case the more expensive one is the cam traptions motion sensor if you build it yourself you're about 70 euros you need the cables to connect to the ca uh, camera which is about 30 euros depending on how good and how good the quality is of the cables then you need like 32 AA batteries, which is to just change all the batteries all the time for the flashes and the motion sensor, and which is incomplete about 50 euro. Then you need a replacement battery for the camera, which is about 30 euros. You need two XD cards, which are about 40 euros maybe you also have some then you can just erase it from your calculation so in complete we come about six to seven hundred euros and you can even dump that price if you're lucky and get the camera or the lens or the flashes cheaper second hand you can dump that maybe about to 500 euros but I plan on that amount of money I calculated here because there's always something you forgot or there's always something you need additionally. So I guess with six to six, uh, 700 euros, you're good to go. But how about this wireless system I have here? So first we have the same thing as in the wired system. We have the camera we have the lens, we have the two flashes, which are in price just the same. The housing is also 40 euros, that's all the same. Now comes the first thing that is more expensive, that are all those wireless transmitters. You need to calculate about 80 euros. Um, then you have the motion sensor which is not wired it is wireless the one i have here it is about 190 euros right now uh, if you make yourself a custom build one with a wireless function you will be around about 90 euros then also 32 aa batteries which is about 50 euros then a very big more additional money are 16 D cells, which are incomplete, about 95 euros. Then also the 
camera replacement battery, the two SD cards and you need a connection cable from the D cells to the uh, transmitter. So yeah, that is also around about 50 euros with a holder for the D cells. So with a wireless system you start where you just ended with a wired system you start round about 775 euros and end up to 875 euros just for this system. What is still missing are some individual costs just such as a tripod, some spray cans for the coloring of your housing, the flash housings you need to buy something for that you can just use a bag but I don't like it that much because the flashes are pretty expensive and I want to have it secure in such a case or camouflage nets uh, and there are plenty other things that I don't get in mind right now but they are always missing something. For my calculation I always add like two to three hundred euros to my calculation uh, to cover these costs and just to be absolutely safe. In general I think the more you do yourself, the cheaper it is, but it also costs a lot of time. All in all, you could have to calculate between 800 and 1000 euros for a wired system. And for a wireless system, I will calculate around about 975. If you put a bit more, it's about 1000 to 1175 which is round about 1200 euros, which I actually paid for the setup I have here. This may sound like a lot at first, but if you buy a regular camera, just put a body and a lens on it. And in my case, the Nikon Z6 with a 150 and 500 millimeter from Nikon, you're already at double the price what you have to spend on such a camera trap system. And it's not including things like tripods or gimbal heads or so. Nevertheless, camera trap photography is not cheap. Because the probability of damage or theft, of course, is not insignificant. But so much for the numbers. If you're not deterred yet, we can move on the theoretical part and the camera and the flash settings. First of all, let's move to the camera. Of course, like everywhere else, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution. But I have found out two ways to optimally adjusting the camera. In any case, I recommend the manual setting with a full manual or auto ISO maximized up to ISO 400. In case I want the image to be sharp in any case, I set an exposure time of 1 to 100. The aperture is always set to 8 to 10 depending on how large I want to have the plane of focus. If you want to take a little more risk but also want to capture like the starry sky at night or the Milky Way with the animal in front, I definitely recommend setting the camera to 25 seconds or like 30 seconds exposure time. The aperture is still at 8 to 10, I think that is always the case. I never did set it higher or lower and of course ISO 1 to 400. That results in pictures that are much too bright during the day but are completely illuminated correctly when you have it at night. And if you are like almost like predators or special animals, they are always active at night. But however, there is a great risk there because for example, if there is, I had the case for a lynx image I had, there is a full moon or there is snow or you didn't set the flash correctly which it can be also the case and um, then there is an effect that is so called the ghosting effect and that one can occur then. And that's not so nice when you have a nice animal, you have nice scenery and the thing is ghosted. But if you're lucky and everything fits together, you can create extremely beautiful moods. So you can decide on how much risk you want to take. For the flashes, the exposure time is crucial. 
there is usually I choose between one fourth of a second and one eighth of a second. If the flash is a little further away, I choose also like one and uh, one second of a second. If you are photographing in the snow, you should definitely make sure that it's set at least to one eighth of a second. Otherwise, you get the problem I got with the links in the snow. You can also get a ghosting effect. So now for the theory of placing the sensor. My personal experience is as follows. If you put the, if you narrow the focus exactly on the plane of focus from the camera like this, if I focus like here and I put it here, then it will be perfect. You will just get the shot you need and the shots you want. If you put the, the sensor just like that and make the field of view of the motion sensor a bit bigger, then you'll get easily distracted images and the animals are out of focus or just problems like that that you don't want. The arrangement of the flashes and how many flashes you use is completely up to your creativity. You can just use one. I had the experience that you at minimum least uh, need two to get a little dynamic into the images. I made the, the experience that if you hang the flash is higher, you get much softer and more natural light. I would also recommend to set one flash, which is the main flash, a bit brighter, so at one fourth of a second, and one effect light with the settings one eighth of a second, to bring a bit more dynamic into the picture. You can find the classic application here in this animation I show you, uh, how I set up the classic setup with the with two flashes and if you work with more flashes as you can see in these better images you can also start lighting up the background if you want to to just make the image more pop man more a bit special and um, or you also can create a so-called rim light which is a nice effect I took once with a image of a stone marten uh, and you can create beautiful effects the more flashes you have. Just look for animals that are easy to photograph, just like in my case the badgers, and just play around a bit with the light. There are absolutely no limits on what you can do. But enough about the theoretical part. Now let's go out into the field and I'll show you how I scout my spots and what such a setup looks like in reality. So now we're out in the field and I want to show you how I do my scouting before I even set up a camera trap. So basically I do everything with these guys here. Uh, those are trail cams which uh, record with infrared and with normal camera um, the movement of the wildlife in this area up to 20 meters distance. So I set these guys up near a, a trail where the animals walk by and just let it wait for like four to eight weeks depending on how sure I am if here is something walking by and if there is something walking by and I know this place is perfect then I gonna set up the camera trap the big one but I, in general I think there is just like everything the same just as a regular wildlife photographer does but the only difference maybe is that when I scout locations I take a look that there are no disturbances like joggers, hikers, 
hunters, uh, some foresters or something for one to maximize the, the, um, the point that the animals will come by and I want to minimize that the camera gets stolen. So that are two criteria I want to, to have before I do anything with the big camera trap. But so far so good. Um, I think we're gonna go out now to the camera trap and take a look um, on how such a setting looks like in the real world and how I manage some situations with the flashes, with the motion sensor and with the camera and etc etc. So with no further talking we go up and uh, yeah we'll see the camera trap then. So this is actually the first setup I have here, um, in this case it's for the Lynx, especially for the Lynx. Um, as you can see I built something here for the tray cam, um, but that's nothing about the setup. So let's go down to the settings for the how I set up the, the motion sensor, the flashes and everything. So basically I am here with uh, the Nikon D3200 with a 15 to 55 millimeters. It's pointing in this direction. The trail is coming from two sides. We have on the left side here, we have this big wall. So when the lens appears, it comes from from the left side or from there where you are right now. The trail is coming right through here and we should trigger it when it comes through. So that means that the one, the, the motion sensor is showing where I focus, where the two ways cross. So I get in any way, I get the image sharp. The second thing are the flashes. The flashes are one up here, which is lighting down to the wall uh, to light up the background a bit. And we have one flash up here, which is lighting the animal. So I got the animal sharp and clean in this situation. So all about this setup here. Let's see if we got some images. So you know what I was thinking when I set it up. Now I am on my second uh, place right here uh, where over here on this rock is a marking position from the Lynx. How did I do my setup here? It's pretty simple actually. Um, I, in this case I had in my back from, from this side I didn't have any position from the flash. So I worked here with the, uh, I am working here with the white reflecting texture of the uh, stone here and that one is flashing directly into the rock so the light is reflecting and making it a bit softer in the face of the lynx. Um, I have over here I have one flash which is lighting up into the cave uh, and making the surrounding and the and the background a bit more lighted up but it is a bit darker so um, the main subject is still the lynx and as a little goodie I just built up here is uh, a little deer skull I found um, and I put it up here so when the lynx walks by this could be perfect uh, a perfect image uh, like the lynx is always coming from this side here and walks down here and then marks up his territory on this rock so when it comes here that will be a perfect position I can show you an image of a squirrel I did a few weeks ago here uh, just you have an idea on how the setup will look like the sensor is always 
just a very narrow field and just sh pointing into the cave so that I don't have any disturbed shots from outside. Um, yeah, that's all about how this setup is set up. So, and I guess that's it for the camera trapping tutorial. I really hope it helped you a lot. I would appreciate very much if you leave a like, comment or even subscribe if you like my stuff he I do here and give me some feedback. Send me images on did you use the, the tips I gave you on the camera trapping or was it very interesting. All that would be very interesting for me and I can uh, and all the feedback would be very important for me so I can increase my videos and make it better and better every time I do it and yeah I really hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching and see you the next time